It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. If you're familiar with African-American religious history, you know that black women outnumber black men in the church, and there are a lot of theories about why, too. Famed author Zora Neale Hurston, for example, said that black women were the mules of the world and that the church gave them a place to lay their burdens down. But what if there's something more to it than that? What if women go to church for empowerment, to wield power in sometimes subversive but spiritual ways? Subversive because in many black denominations, only men can be ordained to the clergy, but women have found ways to lead nevertheless. Today we're talking with scholar Anthea Butler. She's the author of the book, Women in the Church of God in Christ. The Church of God in Christ, or Kojic, is a Pentecostal denomination that began at the turn of the 20th century. And as you're about to find out, women have played crucial parts in the development and growth of the church, despite not being ordained. Anthea Butler recently delivered a guest lecture here at the Maxwell Institute on Baptist missionaries who came to Utah to save Mormons. You can find that lecture on our YouTube channel. Questions and comments about this and other episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast can be sent to me at mipodcast at byu.edu. And don't forget to take some time to rate and review the show on iTunes and let people know what you think about the show. Anthea Butler joins us today from the University of Pennsylvania. Thanks for being on the Maxwell Institute podcast. Hey, thanks. Do you mind if I call you Thea? Is that uh, all right? Yeah, that's okay. fine. Okay, good. We're talking about your book called Women in the Church of God in Christ, Making a Sanctified World. And this book tells the story of African-American women's church work in the Pentecostal denomination. This is the Church of God in Christ. So readers might be surprised in a book about Pentecostalism and, and especially African-American women in Pentecostalism to find out that the story begins with a white Baptist woman named Joanna Moore. <laughs> Tell us about her. Well, Joanna Moore is probably actually the reason why I'm actually at BYU doing this podcast, too. So I'm always happy to talk about her. <laughs> Joanna Moore was the first um, American Baptist home missionary to the South. She actually went to a place called Island Number 10 in the middle of the Mississippi River and worked right at the end of the Civil War. And the reason why she starts off this book is because she produced a magazine called Hope, which was a Bible study magazine. And the reason why that Bible magazine came to be was because of the White League, uh, a group who is a precursor to the Ku Klux Klan. And she was working outside of Baton Rouge and had a, a training school for women. And they tried to burn the training school down and they beat the pastor up who started the training school. And so she knew that there had to be a way to reach African-Americans because she wanted to help people learn how to read and write and sort of gather themselves after Reconstruction. And what happened was she decided to do this magazine called Hope, which was a daily Bible study. And it got produced by her, started in Plaquemine, Louisiana. And that was mailed out to people. And it was also sold. So it's kind of interesting because it's a two-fold kind of a piece. And one was you could use it for what you call Bible bands, which is um, Bible studies, which Bible bands still actually exist in black Baptist churches, or you could sell it. And that was a way to make money. And you could also have Bible bands. So it was a twofold kind of thing. Part of it was about entrepreneurship. The other part was about helping people learn how to read and helping them to memorize scripture in a certain kind of way. Was the entrepreneurship a conscious part of it for her? Did she want black women to be able to use it that way? It not wasn't only conscious. It wasn't conscious in the sense of they started off that way. It just became a lot easier to produce because if you could produce and mail out a bunch to one person, then one person could go and sell it. Mm -hmm. They also had subscriptions too, so you could do both ways. Hmm. What made her what, what made her like other white Baptists at the time, and what made her different from other? She wasn't really like any other white Baptist, and I say that in in this sort of way because she lived closely with African Americans, and that's not what at least Southern white Baptists were doing. Hmm. Northern American Baptists, which she was a part of, were basically a lot of them were philanthropists. They wrote a lot about what they needed to do. There were home missionaries like her who followed her, who would end up working with African Americans and other groups, especially Mormons here in Utah. But she wasn't like really any other white Baptist. And I think that's what makes it interesting. Let me put it to you this way. She's not like other white Baptists because when she dies in 1916, 7,000 people are gathered at the Ryman Auditorium in Nashville for her funeral. R.H. Boyd preaches her funeral, who is the head of the National Baptist Convention during that time period. And people are lauding her. She's not like any other white Baptist because she kept correspondence between W.E.B. Du Bois and others around who were – 
big players during that time period, big religious players, big players in education. So she has her hands in a lot of spaces. And there's a long term project I'm going to work on about her. But for right now, you know, I'm still gathering information and doing some research. Yeah, Joanna Moore, she's a fascinating figure. Through her publication, Hope, she's talking about this idea of holy living, Mm -hmm. Uh, but not just holy living for its own sake. There's this Mm -hmm. theological idea of sanctification that was the goal. Talk about what that is, sanctification. Well, sanctification in the Christian tradition goes through a lot of different kinds of phases. If you go through the beginnings of the 19th century, you know, Wesley says that my heart was strangely warm. This is a second experience. He's a Methodist. And, yes, yeah. he's a Methodist. And people talk about this sanctification experience. For in the time period that Moore is in, sanctification is seen a couple of ways. One is about um, you are free from sin. You are able to be sinless before God, right? There's another way to think about sanctification, and that's what a lot of um, English or what we call Keswick people thought about, which was endowment of power for service. It gave you the power to serve others. And so Moore is kind of an interesting person because she's straddling both of these, I think. And so the ways in which she thinks about sanctification is it sets people apart. It sets her apart. If you get sanctification, it will set you apart to do good works. But it also is a way to think about race and racism during this time period, because she has a way of saying that, you know, if you're in this movement, if you're in the holiness movement, which was a part of during that time, then you should see everyone as equal. And as we know, you know, post-Reconstruction period was not like that at all. No. No, so sanctification was supposed to change you. Then. Yeah, it, it had like, to change it. Yeah. Did they think that it would make you perfect at some point? That you literally mm-hmm. wouldn't Absolutely. sin in Absolutely. this life? In this lifetime, you would be perfect. You could you could achieve sinless perfection, and so that's part of the sanctification. I think it's hard for people to see, and then you needed to live that out. You needed to prove it. So you know, you didn't smoke. The joke I like to say is what people said back then: you don't smoke or drink or or chew or go with girls that do right. So you have to think about how what you do, what you wear, how you. Behave behave in public, all of those things become a real big part about living what is called a sanctified life. And there were some disagreements among Baptists about sanctification and mm-hmm. maybe even how to tell that you were had been sanctified. Right? Absolutely. And so for some ba- uh, Baptists during this time period, sanctification is about, you know, sort of a theological way, but you don't have to do all of these things to live it. And then others said, oh, yes, you do. And you, you we need to make the difference between the two. So E.C. Morris, who's one of the people who is at the beginning of the uh, National Baptist Convention in 1895, has a big tract about sanctification. And what ends up happening, it breaks up black Baptists. They split up because over this issue of sanctification. And the people who start the church that we're going to be talking about, the Church of God in Christ, leave this Baptist, black Baptist group to form their own sort of holiness group. Yeah, talk about that idea of holiness, because this seems to be the concept that really was swirling with controversy. Yeah, I mean, the holiness movement is, I want to talk about it as a movement first, because I think that's a really important way to talk about this. If we talk about 19th century religion, it's not just about healing at the end of the 19th century. It's about holiness. So you'll hear the words holiness and healing going together. And people have, and both of those movements kind of come together and say, we have some thoughts about what sanctification really is. It becomes a big argument. For Baptists, Baptists are cessationists. They don't believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They don't believe in speaking in tongues that stopped at the believe, new testament yeah, that stops at the new testament after yeah. after jesus leaves you know and they and they do a little bit of stuff no more of that okay so <laughs> no more of that stuff but these people really believe that can happen so they're praying for healing they are looking for what would be the evidence of the second blessing are now, other baptists looking askance at this yeah like, other baptists oh, whoa, are going like yeah they don't like that they don't like it at all and that's a that's an anathema to them and so you have a lot of splits because of that and this is right before the beginnings of the pentecostal movement So they're trying to work something out theologically, but at the same time, these people who end up going into Pentecostalism from the holiness movement are also looking for different signs to show how they're sanctified. And, you know, it didn't have to be just dress and all of that. They were looking for some kind of experience that would make that happen. Yeah, what kind of experiences? And that would be speaking in tongues. And so somebody Mm. named Charles Parham. It's not really a part of this book, but it's kind of tangentially important. Believes that the second blessing is evidenced by speaking in tongues or glossolalia. What was the first blessing? Uh, the first, the first blessing is sort of something different. You just know that you're sanctified because you're okay. in it. Okay, you you're achieve, achieving perfection. But the then proof of that is blessing. that yeah, the proof of that second blessing is you get to speak in tongues. How do we okay. know that we're sanctified? We speak in tongues, right? Was that the chief symbol for well, him? That for for him, yes. For some 
some others, yes. And then we get too deep in the weeds if I start going into the, you know, all the little fine, finer points of who thinks what and why. But for this particular book, Church of God in Christ, which is the church that forms out of the split, one of the churches that forms out of the split, they believe that you can have the second blessing. And you didn't necessarily have to speak in tongues, but you definitely had to live a sanctified life, which is, you know, free from swin, no drinking, no none of that stuff. Right? Did Joanna Moore feel like she did, did she testify that she received? That oh, second yeah. Blessing? Yeah, she did. Yeah. She has a whole um, there's a whole sort of bi biography of her called In Christ's Stead, where she talks about her life and working with African-Americans. And she talks about her experience of being, you know, being sanctified and how that happened for her. And I think that's a way in which she tries to negotiate her space within, you know, both sides of the track. I mean, this is a difficult position that she's in as a white woman yeah. to be ministering to African-Americans during this time period. And to a group of African-Americans that seems to be kind of breaking off from this other group. Well, of yeah, not just that. I mean, it's the South. So you yeah. just don't do that if you're a white woman. Yeah. You don't. Sorry. And then even in, yeah, and then even in the circles that she was running in, there was yeah. division there too. So she was mm -hmm. entering into these. Yeah. That's a really layered situation mm -hmm. for her. And Very much so. she wanted people to become sanctified like her then. This Hope magazine, mm. did she talk about her sanctification experience in there as well? No, or you know, the Bible magazine, stuff? the magazine is very different. The magazine is more like you got 30 or 31 days of Bible study. And then you have people writing to her and she prints letters. Oh, okay. So you see the correspondence. Occasionally she might tell a story about herself, but this magazine is more geared towards the people who are experiencing Bible bands or reading the magazine and she wants them to see themselves in that and so what they start doing late in the 1890s is to also put their own pictures in it it comes alongside what was called a fireside school so she produced materials that were able to be sold that would sort of teach a range of you know children maybe from the age of three or four to about maybe early teens you know so they covered dating and courtship and marriage and you know how to clean the house you know mm -hmm. what Jesus wants you to do those kinds Kinds of things mm -hmm. yeah and there was also the idea i mean she wanted people to c become literate too right so yeah, she's using the bible through this publication mm -hmm. to help yeah help teach people that as well yeah. lizzie robinson is someone who comes up mm -hmm. in the book is she was a former slave mm -hmm. an african-american who was deeply moved by mm -hmm. joanna moore's yeah. message what made the idea of sanctification so powerful to former slaves like lizzie why was this resonant well i think part of it is about you know what people say about black bodies i mean if you think that the you know your body is not not worthy you've been you've been enslaved you know you constantly have white people telling you all the time that you are less than human this is the time of you know social darwinism if you look at any of the charts during this time period african americans are the lowest on the scale in terms of the races this is racial hierarchy and classification I think for somebody like, you know, Lizzie Robinson, who may not have seen all of that, but certainly would have experienced people behaving that way towards her mm -hmm. in the South, I think that sanctification offers something for her. Um, I should say there's something that you don't know that's not in the book. One of the things that's really interesting about her is that she actually shows up a lot earlier than I ever thought when I wrote the book. Mm. She actually shows up in a lot of um, anti-lodge and anti-alcohol material. So she's actually she's someone. An activist. Yeah, she's a, she's an activist even before huh. she gets to hope because they're showing letters from her in another piece called Christian Sinusure, where she's writing to them. And I think as a result of doing this temperance work, probably is how she saw the Hope magazine, and that's when she says she becomes sanctified because she was reading the magazine and sanctification so she was seeking the same kind of thing that joanna moore was seeking yeah, this yeah. way of sort of remaking your body and believing that your body is worthy of mm -hmm. this sanctification as yeah. well which was was elevating and, and i think uh, you know self-esteem was an issue here or, or a consideration so sanctification wasn't meant to be just a private thing though right no 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 it's a very public thing you need to show that you are i mean because it doesn't matter i mean if it's something interior what's the point the point is to be a witness and then also, yeah, witness mm -hmm. so that you can also bring other people into mm -hmm. that too. Yeah, and this absolutely. was kind of the networking yeah. that happened. So what 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 was Lizzie Robinson doing? Well, I mean, at, well, let's talk about it in terms of the books. I think this is easier. So let me just sort of lay out kind of a kind of a map here so you can see what happens. 
she becomes sanctified. And what happens because of that is she gets involved in some prayer groups. She gets introduced to the person who is going to end up being the leader of the denomination. She will belong to the Church of God in Christ. And he sort of asks her to come along and, you know, let's see how this is going to work out. You might be able to help me because I have these loose bands of praying women. Now, these were all probably mostly Bible bands. And the reason why I know that is because there was sort of a group of women in Memphis and there was a school in Memphis that they were all attached to. So what happens with Lizzie Robinson is that at the beginning, she sort of gets along with all the rest of these women that are in this Church of God in Christ group. Now, the problem with Church of God in Christ is that they start off as a holiness group, but Bishop Mason, who's the founder, ends up going to the Azusa Street Revival in 1907. This is in California. In California, in Los Angeles, and he speaks in tongues. And that's not a good match for the guy he's with, uh, Charles Price Jones, who doesn't, who's holiness, who's sanctified, but doesn't think speaking in tongues is part of all this stuff. He's a cessationist. Yes, he's a, he, yeah. Well, he's not a cessationist. He just doesn't think that speaking in tongues is proper. He doesn't think it's huh. right. And too so, weird, too enthusiastic? What no, was his it's, issue? It's, the, it's the nuance about what you think theologically. So again, weeds, right? Okay. And then, so we don't want to get too deep for okay. everybody. But basically, they disagree about how you get to see sanctification. Sanctification. For some people, speaking in tongues was the sign that you were sanctified. For other people, you didn't need that sign to be sanctified. And that's the, probably the simplest way to explain it. Yeah. But that becomes a real point of contention with them, and they end up suing each other. Hmm. And Mason walks off with the name Church of God in Christ and most of the people. And um, Ch uh, Charles Price Jones makes a group called Church of God in Christ Holiness. They are much smaller. And they don't have the incorporation. And so let me say this, too, because this becomes important. Incorporation is a big deal. You don't think about this when we think about religion or religious groups. But incorporation is a huge deal. If you become incorporated during this time period, you get 75% off of your railway ticket if you're a pastor in that group. So all the men who get ordained can get 75% percent off of their ticket on any train line, which makes it easy for them to become mobile. Not so great for women because they weren't ordaining women, but you know, it does save a lot of money. So this was a really important you know, thing that he won. And so with Lizzie Robinson, I think both of them end up becoming kind of this interesting mother and father figure in the denomination in a sense at the beginning, because they help to grow it in different kinds of ways. Yeah, and they come together to sort of make Church of God in Christ become what it became. Yeah. And you mentioned these differences between men and women and, and what their roles mm -hmm. were like. And in the second chapter of your book, you say that Pentecostalism provided African-American women with both struggles and opportunities to advance in ministry. These are women like L Lizzie Robinson. They were sometimes seen as speaking out of turn. Yeah, well, I think Lizzie Robinson, this is the, the complication of thinking about things like this. There's a part in the book that I talk about where she has a group of women meeting and she says, how many of you have been called to be a preacher? And these women stand up and she says, every last one of you sit down, every last one of you sit down. God did not call you to be preachers, you know? But she obviously could be a speaker and a leader. So there is a lot of um, tension between charismatic authority, what you could wield as a woman because you could prophesy, you could speak speaking tongues, you were a good speaker, you were a good Bible teacher, and this temporal authority, and I like to call it that's a temporal authority of you can be ordained as a pastor. Now in this denomination, you can't be, women could not be ordained, okay? But they had what um, Cheryl Townsend Gilks called a dual sex structure. So men were had an Episcopal structure where they were able to be ordained. Women sort of rose up through the ranks once this women's department gets started, and you know, soon after the split in the denomination with Lizzie Robinson. Robinson at his head. And so there were roles for women, but you couldn't be in an ordained role. So in that sense, you had charismatic authority, you just didn't have real authority. And she had ways of justifying this too, just in the way that she talked about what she was doing. So she would say, I'm not preaching, I'm teaching. Exactly. And preaching and teaching is a, is a, a connotation that people still use today. So preaching is sort of like exhorting, you're standing in front of the pulpit, you're running a Sunday service. You could be a Bible teacher, you could run a Bible study, you could do all of those things. You could say, this is a moment where we're going to teach you about the scriptures and teach you how to read them or teach you how to understand them or exegete them. But you couldn't say you were a preacher because that was a male role. And that became a very, very interesting way. So it was a negotiation that women were always doing. If you said, I'm a Bible teacher, it's a lot easier than saying I'm a preacher. Hmm. Do you see any irony in that? The fact that you mentioned the meeting where she stood up mm -hmm. in kind of as a leader and yeah. said, who, who, who thinks they're a preacher here? And then tells them, all, actually, you're not. You can't yeah. be. But she's, she's mm -hmm. 
being a leader in that moment. Yeah, no, you know, no, I don't see any irony in it. And if you work long enough with reading women's stuff, you realize that sometimes women are the ones who tell other women what to do far more than men. And that's the, you know, the irony of all of this is that women are sometimes are better policemen for patriarchy than men are. So yeah, she's definitely she's definitely doing that, but she's doing it in this in the specific role that she holds. And I think, you know, for her being this very strict holiness woman, you know, with a certain way of dressing and a certain way of being, there was just no room for error for her. There's yeah, no what was her personality error. like? Pretty stern. Yeah. I mean, she's you know she wears long black skirts, wh very starch white blouses, you know, um, showing no skin whatsoever, pulled back hair. You couldn't really per you know there were ways in which African American women could straighten their hair during this time period. No makeup whatsoever. You know, very matriarchal in a way. And she became a leader with some charisma, but also you talk about how people described her as kind of cold as a yeah, person. Yeah, pretty cold. And actually, somebody who was even arranging marriages at one time. Tell me know, about that. People, oh, no, she actually would say, you know, you belong with this person if she went to some church uh -huh. or something and it was somebody single. So she felt like it was it, it was her uh -huh. part of her, you know, Christian duty to help people get together or to say, you know, you're in sin. You can't do this. You you cannot do this. And so this became this is a very big point of contention in a lot of Pentecostal churches because divorce was not a thing back then. You didn't get divorced. Right. So and a lot of people, um, one of the things that ends up being a very big deal in a denomination is called double marriages. And when I started doing the project, I thought, oh, double marriage must mean that you are divorced and you got remarried. That's not what it meant. It meant that you actually were a bigamist hmm. because you'd move, you know, you might be in a Southern state and you'd have mm -hmm. a family yep. and you moved to Chicago during the great migration and you got another wife. Right. So that created a lot of problems for people. Because, double standards yeah, too, you yeah, talk yeah, about double in the standards, book. How yeah. was it different for men and women? Well, it's different for men because you could go get another wife. If you did that as a woman, you know, and somebody found out about it, obviously you would not be considered to be a nice woman. And there were women who were even mm -hmm. cut off or excommunicated. Yeah, you, cut, you, or... get, you get cut off. I mean, there's a great story in the book about a woman who is married to a man and she he's he's got a wife somewhere and she he gets to stay in the denomination and gets to keep being a preacher and she's, she's sat down from being an evangelist. They she didn't even she know. Can't. He was the yeah. one that was she married was to one. other people. Yeah. <laughs> he's the one that's married to somebody else. I mean, this happened to a lot of people. Yeah. It's a terrible story, but you know. Mason was really impressed with Lizzie Robinson, and he elevated her to what you refer to as General Overseer of Women's Work. That was like the original title. Mm -hmm. I don't yes, think that title, title stuck. Yeah. What was that position about in the context of the church well, organization? In the context of the church, it was like, you take care of all the, the things that are going on with women. So basically, if there are women in trouble in the church, if there are women that need to be you know, in certain places within the church, let's say, what this is during the Great Migration, of course, so you've got a lot of movement up to Chicago and Detroit yes, and other Black places. people moving up from the south yeah, to, to the, the north. north. And then yeah. you actually have people moving west, too, which is another kind of migration altogether, Los Angeles. What ends up happening is that you've got lots of women who are being raised up in churches who have this same kind of charismatic authority. But you need to have something to do with them. How do you get them organized? So you can't just have like a Bible band leader. You end up having what was called back then a church mother. And so the church mother was somebody who was, you know, in the church, who was, you know, usually an older person who had, you you know, spiritual and charismatic authority that the pastor trusted. And they usually ran things. And so she had to be in contact with all these women who were church mothers. And then as time went on, they established a way that they would have what would end up being called a state supervisor and then a national supervisor. And so that was a way that women would come together and begin to meet. They didn't start meeting till much later as a group, but there was always a day at the convocation, which was the annual meeting for the denomination, that they would have a day where they would be able to get together and sort of lead the service as women. You know, quote, as unquote. women over women. Yes, right? as women over women. And men would be in attendance. So they could lead a meeting with men in attendance oh, yeah, as well. They, yeah, they just weren't preachers. So they you were might just get teaching. A, yeah, they were just teaching. So that, again, that's the whole thing. They weren't preachers. Was Mason drawing on other groups for inspiration here in this organizational structure? I'm not sure about that. I don't think so but i mean there were lots of other kinds of models around i like mean what about in the baptist church did they have a women's yeah, department they, in a they had a way? women's department but that hadn't been around that long hmm. that only got started in 1900 and they were out by then they weren't baptist by then so and what they were doing was much very different than what kojic did and so i think hit the ingenuity of mason is that he just said i've got a woman who's a great organizer why not just let her organize 
You know, and in that sense, you know, in some ways he wasn't a great manager because sometimes when there was strife, he would just, you know, like, let's just pray. And then he'd pray for the next three hours. Right. So he just until everybody got tired and they forgot what they were fussing about in the first place. (laughs) That's a good idea. Yeah, no, it is. But, you know, it's kind of frustrating for people sometimes. Yeah. The people that want their problems solved. Yeah. But uh, Mason was sort of like, you need to do this. You know, he had certain ideas about things. I think, you know, when I think about the big ideas of things that he wanted to do, part of that had to do with, you know, let the women organize themselves. We need education and we need to have a big building for this church. I mean, there's the three big things that happen before 1945 that are big pieces of the church that go on to sort of anchor everything. Do you think Mason, do you think he bucked against the restrictions that were put on women or do you think he was fully aligned with them and just found these other ways to sort of work around them? I think that he was clever in the sense that he knew how to work work around certain kinds of constrictions and it just didn't bother him as much. I mean, I, I don't see him as being a person who thought a lot about what everybody else was doing. Mm. And I think he feels like a, he was led by God B that this is something that, you know, he could do that was different and C there was already, there was already a free floating structure in place. Yeah. And part of that had to do with, um, you know, hope and, and the um, magazine and, people the Bible did, bands. Yeah, and the Bible bands and all this stuff. So there was a, there was a natural way to organize, but it was just easier to let them take it and do what they needed to do with it. And plus, women provided a lot of the resources for the church. I mean, you know, they're the ones who it's easiest for them to get, you know, a house cleaning job or, you know, taking care of child rearing or something. If you move from the south to the north, it was a, easier for them to be able to meet together. It's easier in a time of lynching and racial violence for women to do things that men can't do, you know, because it's easier because you're not seeing a black man walking down the road mm-hmm. in the south instead of a white two black women walking down the road right so this is this means that the church can grow in a different way and so it was easy so somebody like you know the next person we're going to talk about um lillian brooks coffee it's easy for her to go to detroit you know as an older teen and begin to dig out what's called dig out a church because She's a young woman, and she doesn't have the same encumbrances. We're talking with Anthea Butler. She's graduate chair and associate professor of religious studies and and Africana studies at the University of Pennsylvania. We're talking about her book, Women in the Church of God in Christ, Making a Sanctified World. You just mentioned Lillian Coffey, Thea, and uh, in, in chapter three, you introduce her to the story. She would ride to leadership in the Church of God in Christ, but she was not a carbon copy of Lizzie who came before her. No, not at all. And I think there's a really important reason why she's not a carbon copy, not for the obvious reasons, but she's raised in Mason's home. And that is a very different thing because they had a very close relationship. And so this is somebody, A, he really trusts, B, he raises up almost like his own daughter. So that get, affords her a different kind of place within the denomination than everybody else has. And the um, eventual relationships that she would go on to make alongside with um, someone else, Renee Mallory, would become sort of this way that the denomination would begin to change and change in some really good ways, in a sense, to, to sort of enter into the 20th century, as it were. I think she's also different because she's she's probably what somebody would have called a go-getter. So she didn't let a lot of grass grow under her feet. So first she's taking care of Mason's kids and she moves, she ends up being sent up to Chicago and becomes friends with a couple of people who become very important in the church. Louis Ford is one of them who ends up being a bishop later on. And she starts the process of uh, you know, I'm going to put it in quotation marks, preaching on street corners and then gathering people and what they call digging out of church. In other words, starting from scratch. And then you get a, a group of people together and you meet in a storefront, basically. And she ended up starting, I can't remember the exact number. It's probably somewhere uh, between eight and 10 churches in Chicago area that are really founded by her work, you know, doing evangelization on the streets. And it would be hard for people like her because they would go dig out a church, as you said, but then as women, they couldn't then take leadership over that very no. church that they established. No, but you could call a friend. And usually what happened was people would write and say, we have enough people for a church and I know this man who would be really good at it. And so it was kind of an interesting way of women being able to point out, and that didn't always work, but they'd be able to say, this person might be a really good pastor for this church. And that person might get the call and they'd be able to go up and take that church. And it made it really good for, for them because basically this would usually be somebody you could work with. This was somebody who was open to having women do things within the congregation. Sometimes that worked out very well. Sometimes it didn't. What's an example of when it didn't? Like, 
Well, when it doesn't work is when the pastor comes up and says, I don't want you there, or it doesn't work when sometimes you might even be married and you think that you're supposed to do things that your husband is not. So there's one particular instance in the book that I talk about in California where there's um, Emma Cotton and her husband and they're down in San Diego and she ends up being, I think, probably a more charismatic preacher than he is. And so that runs into a lot of problems for them because you you can see where she's taken over mm -hmm. from where, you know, this is supposed to be, oh, you're going to do the women's stuff and I'm going to do the men's stuff. And you just see her sort of rising yeah, and, and him and the sort people of people are responding to her. Yeah, people responding to her, but they're not really responding to her husband. Mm -hmm. So that creates a little bit of stress for them. And she bolted, right? Didn't yeah, she, she, but ended she ends up bolting, but she comes back and it's, it's okay. Happy but, story in the yeah, end. Yeah, happy <laughs> story in the end. But, you know, I think it's a tension between, you know, when you have charismatic figures and one person is more charismatic than the other party and that marriage, then it mm. ends up becoming a problem. Yeah, marriage marriage comes up throughout the book in really mm. interesting ways. Gender roles continue to change. As you mentioned, uh, Lillian Coffey was someone who was moving the, the denomination in a future-oriented mm -hmm. direction. Yeah. Here. What was concerning to her that she thought needed to change? Well, one of the things, I, I wouldn't know if it was, I would call it concerning. It's, it's probably more like how do you how do you change when you're introduced to something else and so one of the ways that she's introduced to something else i would say that's in the 1930s is she's introduced to mary mcleod bethune through someone else we'll probably talk about shortly arenia mallory and this is through the um, educational system and kojic kojic starts a school outside of jackson mississippi in the late 1920s and arenia mallory is a very different kind of person than everyone else in the church because she comes from a big family in Chicago. They are well known. Ethel Waters ends up being a relative of hers. And he, uh, Mason asked her to go down south to take care of this church. Now, the two of them become friends. But the issue here is, is that with bringing um, Irene and Mallory in, it, a whole nother world opens up. And that world opens up between black women's sororities movements and black women's club movements. Before this, you have somebody like Lizzie Robinson who's dressing very plainly, blah, blah, blah. And then when the AKAs, basically is a black sorority that starts in Howard, comes down to Mississippi to work at St. Schools, that is the moment when things start to change because Networking. you get you get a bunch of vibrant, young African-American women who are very stylishly dressed alongside some people who are not so stylishly Was dressed. Was that scandalous at first? Well, they it's came scandalous. In. Yeah, scandalous because they end up having to change their clothes, you know, so that's that's one thing. They can't wear short dresses. They can't, you know, they can't wear hose in certain kinds of ways. It's, so All they came and played happened. ball when they came down. Yeah, there. yeah, they yeah. played ball. They had to. I mean, it's the South and they're with this church. But it opens up a space for Kojic women to begin to meet other kinds of, you know, uh, society black women. And so through that uh, association and friendships that they had with Mary McLeod Bethune, who's close to Eleanor Roosevelt during this time period, they just get a whole nother thing. And so both Lillian Brooks Coffee and Arania Mallory go into this black women's club movement or what was called the National Council of Negro Women. And that's a very important group in terms of thinking about different org organizations of black women. Now, here's where the tension is. The tension is, is that if you are in this world of very, you know, elite black women in the late 30s and the 40s and the 50s, and you belong to a church that values holiness and sanctification and right living, and you dress frumpy and they have really nice suits and hats on and everything else, you've got to disconnect, right? Because the disconnect is, is that we're living in two worlds. One world is this very world of holiness and the other world is this very fashionable world, club movement, politically involved, um, involved with, you know, segregation and trying to, you know, civil rights, all of this stuff. So these women are straddling two different worlds and they have to figure out how we're going to bring our worlds together. And I think this is the genius of Lillian Brooks Coffee. So one of the things she starts to do after she takes over from um, Lizzie Robinson is that she says it's okay to start wearing makeup and they she start... She tells the women's department yeah, this? The women, yeah, it's, it's okay to wear makeup. Mm. But actually, more importantly, they start to advertise in the newspaper women's undergarments, like mm. girdles and things mm -hmm. like that, because that was like a no-no. Mm. And she started wearing her hair straight, which is is another big thing because you can't really you know you were not supposed to be straightening your hair during this time period that i want to dig into why yeah. a little bit more right you talk yeah. about 
the, throughout this history, racism is is stronger than ever mm-hmm. here, right? So in the mm-hmm. face of racism, you say that black people had to restructure the public image mm-hmm. of the black physical frame yeah. from bestial to Negro. Mm-hmm. They wanted black people to look and act differently if yeah. they were ever going to be sanctified or respectable even. Well, it's more it's it's more than that. I mean, I, one of the things that I disagree with, and I'll just you know be blunt about it, is that, you know, there's another great book on black women. Um, the, one of the first ones that's written by Ellen Brooks Higginbotham called Righteous Discontent. She's writing about black Baptist women, and she says it's a politics of respectability. She says in, in that that the politics of respectability was about, you know, dressing right right so that white people would not make a judgment which i think is true to a certain extent but in kojic this is about not dressing right for white people is dressing right for god kojic is church of god in christ in yeah, case anyone church, forgot yeah, yeah they, they, we're doing this for god we're not we're, you know white people don't matter here okay but what yeah, this the, matters is to god so this is a reframing in a way of sanctification not because of the public but it's also about the private and who we're going to be in this denomination and how we're going to show that a god is blessing us two that we're we're sanctified in this sort of way so whereas where people have been wearing long skirts and all this stuff before that doesn't really quite work in the 30s and 40s right how do you modernize and so one way to modernize is to sort of redefine what it means to be a sanctified woman and that's what lillian brooks coffee did she was able to model that to other women so if you're you know if you're second in command to lizzie robinson who's you know an older woman going into her 80s and you're dressing a little bit more fashionably but not too fashionably because you don't want to get her upset and by the time Lizzie Robinson passes away in 1945, that's when this whole thing really just changes in a certain kind of way. And you begin to see how women's dress changes in the denomination, how sanctification gets reframed in a certain kind of way. So it's, you know, it's the same thing, except that it's a lot nicer suit. It's a lot nicer hat. You know, you might be wearing gloves. You might have a fashionable purse on. You don't wear these frumpy kinds of things. And you can press your hair, which means to straighten your hair. You can and you can do that. And so I think for her, this is a way of bringing these two worlds that she has together, the world of the club movement, and you know, which is a political social world, and this world, this religious movement that comes together with it. Do you think they lost a lot of members as a result of that change? No, actually, they probably gained some. Hmm. And this is the this is the biggest part. I mean, one of the things that ends up being very problematic for people, especially in the Great Migration, is that they say, "Oh, we don't want to join those people. They look frumpy. They, you know, they don't they don't drink. They don't do this. They don't they don't dance. They don't do all this other stuff." And so, when this begins to change, it brings a whole other kind of woman into the into the group. So I think for them, this was a moment of growth. It's not a moment of retrenching at all. I mean, what becomes I think interesting is how they have to, you know, negotiate this in certain kinds of ways. And so how did they, you know, how did they do it? I mean, obviously they did, you know, wearing pants is a bad thing, right? That kept straight through. You don't wear pants, you know, with Lizzie Robinson, you don't wear pants with Lillian Brooks coffee, but you definitely wear a different kind of skirt with Lillian Brooks coffee. You're not wearing a skirt down to the ground. You're mm-hmm. wearing something else that's much more fashionable. So there was some consistency there. This yeah, is this the consistency trick for, is just yeah. different, you know, in terms of mod- modulation of it. Yeah, that's the trick for for when religions undergo change through mm-hmm. time to also maintain this idea that their principles are eternal and, yeah. and unchanging, but also how do you? How, yeah, how do you do that and yeah. not you know not fall off the radar for the exactly. people that you're trying to bring into the sanctification movement? Exactly. Also, you point out an interesting tension with the teachings about women's bodies, that they were made responsible oftentimes for men's immorality, like if they dressed improperly, right? Yeah, yeah, um, that's always a big thing. Um, but what do you do if you dress improperly? I mean, I remember Lizzie Robinson says one of these things, you just, you know, you gotta bring, you know, these skirts are in the wrong spot in your body. If you, you know, it looks like you see you see everything. Yeah, and you they gotta, poems. I'm, I'm being nice, I'm not quoting yeah. exactly what she yeah, says. Yeah. But um, there were songs and poems about it too, like yes. rusty knees. Yes, so rusty knees, it, you know, women's, women's dress, you can't hide, you know, mm-hmm. that's the one from F.W. McGee. I tell you, I thought the women had done bad enough when they hacked their dresses off up to and above their knees. But after raising them from the bottom, they lowered them from the top. Till it's a disgrace to some of the men, and of course it's a pleasure to others. Ain't that right, brothers? And not only that, they have discontinued them all together along the arm line. I tell you, it's hard for me to stay safe. 
with women dressing as they do. All kinds of fine underwear. And I tell you, they don't buy it to hide it either. Father, dresses so short, they can't hide. I hope none of you folks won't go to the devil on the account of this dressing affair. Of course, you see, it's the preacher's business to tell you about. Now, I'm reminded of a song. The light's turned on. You can't hide. Can't you ever sing that? Oh, the light's turned on. It's great stuff, but there's a lot of emphasis on what you should wear and what you shouldn't wear, especially if you're you're in the urban space. You have a lot of opportunities to see, wow, somebody's got their flapper dress on. Wow, somebody's got this really, you know, a lot shorter skirt on. You might want to try it, but you'd also really get, you know, censured by the women in in the denomination. So there would be things that actually were made up, like lap cloths, for instance. If if your skirt was too short, you sat down in the service, somebody would just sort of throw a hanky over you and cover your legs. If you went up to the altar to pray, and the skirt was too short they put something over you or they cover you with what was called a modesty cloth right and so nobody could see anything so these become really interesting you know sort of pieces to what happens in in a worship service in a black church too especially in culture churches because that modesty can't just be about outside the church it also has to be inside the church too and that's where the idea of modesty seems to have kind of shifted mm-hmm. for the Church of God in Christ, where modesty initially wasn't just about covering skin. That mm-hmm. was a big part of it. But it was also about not dressing ostentatiously, yeah. or not uh, yeah. you know, spending a lot of money. And that that part kind of fell away, but the, the skin coverage element didn't fall no, away. No, the skin right? coverage doesn't fall away, but it started getting more expensive, and that's the truth. And then if you – you know, the book doesn't really go into this, but if you get into the 70s and 80s, 1980s in the church, this whole thing explodes into like complete fashion show where people are spending lots and lots and lots of money on clothing and an adornment, as I call it, you know, whether mm-hmm. that's hats or shoes or whatever. There's lots of money going into that. And I think that that was for a lot of people, especially older people in the denomination, a problem because they said, well, you know, holiness is supposed to be this and you're doing all of this stuff. But it also creates a whole nother kind of, you know, cottage industry within the church for people to sell things, you know, magazines, all kinds of things that end up happening because of because of this change in dress. Do you think women internalize that a lot? I'm thinking in terms of recent conversations about mm-hmm. campus rape culture and things like that where uh, people are saying you shouldn't bring up what a woman was mm-hmm. wearing when she when mm-hmm. she was assaulted. Yeah, I mean, I think this, uh, but that's always a th- been a thing for black women. It's always been a thing. And if you, when we don't have to even talk about it, it's just a Kojic thing. It's always been a thing about, you know, what people think of black women sexually is about, you know, oh, she must be loose, she must be this, she must be that. So the onus is already there because of being racialized. Hmm. And when you're racialized in that way, you know, you have to think about how, what are the ways in which I'm going to fix this? Well, one of the ways I have to fix this is I'm going to make sure that I'm completely covered up. I'm going to make sure that I have the proper clothes on. And in Kojic, it's not only that, it's the the fact that you need to represent the church, you need to be represent a sanctified body. And that's one of the ways you do it. Yeah. And, and with all the downsides that you mentioned, you also say that there's also a sense in which thinking about their clothes in this way was also a kind of empowerment for these women that, mm-hmm. that show that their bodies commanded a certain kind of respect and yeah. that sort of a thing. Yeah, and I mean, within a denomination, it demands respect too because they come up early on with a, with kind of an outfit to wear uh, and, you know, some of the women's leaders. So that gave them a sense in which they had a position within the church, even though they might not be, you know, uh, ordained clergy. But when they had meetings or they had, you know, events and they wore their outfits, they wore the habit or they were their, you know, the surplus, which was a long dress, whatever it was that they were wearing, that was the, you know, how they designed this particular um, outfit for the women's department. That gave them a way in which to have a sort of a, you know, an official position without being official mm. in, a, in a certain way. Routinization of dress helps you to kind of bring everybody together in a certain kind of way. That's Anthea Butler. 
You might have heard her or seen her on MSNBC, CNN, or read her in the New York Times or the Washington Post. She's the author of Women in the Church of God in Christ, Making a Sanctified World, which is one of the only academic books that I've seen that specifically addresses women in the Pentecostal movement. It doesn't seem like a lot of research has been done there. Yeah, there's starting to be some more books. I'm thinking about Judith Castleberry has an interesting book out now, and I'm not I'm going to forget the name of it, but if you look up Judith Castleberry, at, um, and she's in a college in Maine, I'm just forgetting. Uh, but um, she has a really interesting piece out on black Pentecostal women right now too but there's not a lot written and part of that has to do with what I talk about is high boundaries about churches that are really hard to sort of study because they a may not you know they don't like to let a lot of people in they're, they're very kind of closed group and you have to spend time trying to figure out what it is they actually believe and to befriend people and the second part is they might not have normal archives this was not a normal archival project where I rolled up to an archive and I got things I actually had to meet old Older women who had been in the church, people who had been collecting for a long time, actually even got electrocuted while trying to get this book together because I plugged in my laptop at somebody's house and it had a short and it burned my finger. So <laughs> a yeah, shocking experience. Yeah, shocking <laughs> experience. But you know, you do what you have to do to get the material. So that's really interesting. So this was this was something I remember. There's a footnote where you talk about uh, you you wore a sundress to one of the interviews and you regretted yes. that. After yeah, the fact. I did because this was um, this was actually a relative of Bishop Mason who was still alive, and so he's I the went. Founder. And yeah, this this is her... yeah, yeah, yeah. This is his sister. Yeah, and I wore you know a long sundress. I thought I'd done it right, but the sundress had like a square neck and it was short sleeve. And she's like, "Baby, when I you know when I was your age, we wore our sleeves down to our our bone right here at the end of our wrist." And I'm like. <laughs> you know, I know I messed up now. She's not going to talk to me. She ended up talking to me, but I think she talked to me out of pity and just thought I'm just going to pray for her because she's just really not saved. <laughs> yeah, you'd say in the footnote, you say, I wonder what I, what else I could have learned. If yeah, I had, yeah. If, I had had this, if I had the right outfit on, what would she have shown me? You talk about them being sort of closed off a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, the role of education in, in Pentecostalism and in, in these particular Church of God in Christ churches there are stereotypes about them being anti-intellectual or having a strained relationship with education. Yeah. I mean, the stereotypes about that is like, you know, these come from a lot of sociological things that are made in the teens and the 20s. I mean, actually, some of it actually also comes from people like um, Upton Sinclair who ends up writing about Pentecostalism. So there's a sort of sense in which Pentecostals must be dumb, stupid, blah, blah, blah. That's not really true. Um, one of the things that's interesting is that there's a lot of different Pentecostal groups who are trying to do schools and Bible schools and things like that. Now, the question is, is where do you get the education from? And so in Kojic's case, they wanted to make their own school in part because they wanted to be in responsible for educating the youth within the denomination. So that Saints Industrial School that starts out in, in Mississippi becomes an important piece of the denomination. They end up, you know, doing sort of like a trade school thing at first, and then it moves up to be almost a junior college. And then it's, it's now closed. But it was a huge piece of this history of the church. And I think that for them, education, like for many African Americans, was really important during this time period. You don't not get educated. What I do think is that how that education changed was with the entrance of the Alpha Kappa Alphas who came came in and said, the sorority. we're going to help the sorority that says we're going to come in and help. And we're going to, you know, assist you with medical needs and some other things. And that when money starts to kind of flow into the school, that ends up making it sort of the premier place for some of the people, the bishops and others who are higher up in the nomination to send their kids to. As they're making these connections with the outside world, uh, they're also shifting in pretty big ways from positions they held earlier. One of the biggest changes that you point to is the shift away from pacifism. So during mm -hmm. World War One, they were staunchly opposed to the U.S. Yeah. being involved there, but then Pearl Harbor really change mm -hmm. things. Yeah, it really does. I mean, part of that's about, you know, black servicemen, a lot of black servicemen end up going into World War Two, And this whole sort of stance changed. So whereas in World War One, they're sort of against it. Mason gets arrested. There's others in the church that don't do it. 
this by the time they get to world war ii it's like they are on fire and gung-ho and being out there so what you'd see in the whole truth which was the denominational newspaper you'd see letters from um soldiers who were in europe or fighting at other fronts around around the country and they actually start a whole women's group called the wax which are basically like women's corps that helps out with some of the places in which there were servicemen in the united states getting ready to get shipped out so they have their own little outfit they've got all the stuff Arania mallory is a part of that and i thought that was a really interesting piece of all of this because it goes from like we're pacifists over here in 1916 1917 to we are full-blown have a whole women's group that is dedicated to to those who are doing military service and we have our even on our own military sort of outfits to to wear when we're doing this thing and we're trying to help the troops and send them things and all of that so i thought that's a really interesting sort of change but it's also again that turn towards modernism i think that's really important in the denomination and that sort of shifts the way they see themselves in the world there's also a sense in which too later on after the war they really are against communism like a lot of christian groups are they see that as a very big threat and so you start to see in the women's um, department material you know talk about how they support america they support the flag all of this patriotism stuff. skyrockets yeah. patriotism is a big thing and i think it was always there it just becomes a different way of expressing it how did they frame that patriotism in context of other African Americans who understood better than most the the shady history of the United States, how it came about, I, yet they had pride yeah. in this country that had oppressed mm -hmm. their ancestors and even some people that they were directly related to? Yeah, I think one of the big misnomers about Shushkan Christ is that people always think that because they were pacifists and because they took certain stances in 1940, 1950, that they did not have a critique of racism. And they didn't have a critique of America, but they did. And you can see this later in the 1960s where there's certain you know, Kojic figures who get involved in the civil rights movement. And I think for the women's group especially, I think that tension comes about or is probably seen in different sorts of ways once they start to meet in an annual meeting every year. So it's very interesting to see every year how they would have a convocation book when they start to meet in 1951, where they got letters from different authorities. If you look at the 1951, one of the pictures of Renner and Mallory is with um, one of the judges that's someone who's going to end up being a Supreme Court judge. Okay. And that's really important. So they look for governmental figures to sort of send them letters to welcome them, whether that's the president or the governor of the state. They look for all of that as a way to connect themselves to the government. And I think that's a really important piece of that. I think it's Rehnquist, actually, that mm. she tends to taking a picture with. I'm yeah, the, the book really does trace this shift from the early days of the denomination to this bigger embrace of modernism mm -hmm. in a way that still they really wanted to stay true to these fundamental principles. What do you think carried across through these transitional changes from from pacifism to embracing mm -hmm. war? Like what what ideas about sanctification stayed true or stayed not true, but stayed, mm -hmm. you know, stayed similar? Oh, well, I think one big thing, but I could encapsulate it in a song. Um, yes. This is the Church of God in Christ. You can't join it. You got to be born in it. I mean, it's a group of people who have really close ties. And the ways in which they think about sanctification is really important. So they actually have this song that got sung all the time, which was kind of weird for outsiders because they're like, how do we break in, right? But this is a way in which they keep their boundaries up. And you can't, you can't just know what they know. You need to be spending some time there. I think that's one way to do it. I think the other way to do it is that they end up building edifices and, and sort of ways in which they build the denominations different. So, you know, during the war, they get the steel to build Mason Temple. They start to expand Saints School. They start to expand these relationships with different women's groups and different other groups around. They start to, you know, during the 1950s, they go overseas to a couple of ecumenical conferences. They are in the world in a different kind of way. But yet and still, they still really profess sanctification, and that remains a core identifier and a core religious belief of theirs. What does the place of African-American women look like in the Church of God in Christ today? What, what does it well, look that's like? That's interesting because part of it is it's like a lot of older women. It's harder for younger women because there's still prohibition against ordination. So one of the biggest tensions that they have is trying to keep younger women mm. because if there's not a, you know, depending on what church you go to, if you're going to, let's say, a Southern church that's a little more conservative than maybe a church like West Angeles Church of God in Christ, 
there's not a space for you in that kind of more conservative space. If you're in the, you know, the presiding bishop's church in LA, you have lots of opportunities to do some different things. So I think one of the biggest issues they have to face right now is how do they keep younger working women who are professional women involved in the church when these restrictions and these boundaries are so high. So that that's one thing. I think the second is, is that they have an aging population. And so that aging population has to deal with, you know, change in certain kinds of ways. And they, and sometimes that's happened really well and sometimes not. Okay. They also have to deal with the fact that they have, um, like any church that has really high boundaries and high belief systems, you have to figure out how do I engage the world yet still maintain what we believe, you know, whether that's about same sex marriage or abortion or anything else, which all of the things that, you know, Kojic is definitely in line with other evangelical churches and groups that don't believe in those things. Right. So that's a, that's a thing for them. They have to figure that out in the midst of all these different kinds of changes and the midst of pressure to change from, you know, in different kinds of ways theologically. So they're not necessarily prosperity gospel people, but, you know, people like Joel Osteen and others are peeling off things. As a matter of fact, Joel Osteen is going to be speaking at their annual meeting this year, which a lot of people got upset about. They didn't like it. And you wrote about Joel. I wrote about Joel. And I think that, you know, in a way, that's that's their way of trying to accommodate this new space. But it also has really made a lot of people upset. Why in Austin, other, like there's T.D. Jakes, mm -hmm. there are other people like that. Why Austin over someone else? You know, that's my question. I really would like to know who invited Austin. But um, mm -hmm. I think that he's a choice that in one way is an innocuous choice. I mean, he's not anybody who's going to come say anything awful yeah, or anything that they don't pretty, know, right? Pretty basic message. You've yeah. heard it. If you've heard him speak once, yeah, you, you know, know what he's going to say. Yeah, you know exactly yeah. what he's going to say. So it's, it's, you know, it's an uplifting, you know, mm -hmm. I motivational. call it most motivational speaker. He's not really a Christian preacher. I'm yeah. sorry. But he's kind of this motivational person. I think you know, this is where the criticism comes in because they don't see him as being a real Bible person, mm -hmm. right? And a person who knows scripture or a person who understands it. Now, if it had been Joel Osteen's father, that would be a different mm -hmm. thing altogether. And I think actually might what might be happening is that people who remember Joel Osteen's father, who was very much a health and wealth gospel person, but a real, you know, strong kind of Southern white male preacher type who could resonate with some of these Koja people, that is probably the reason why. Maybe they're doing it because he's, you know, that's that's what the past that they remember, but that's not Joel Osteen. Mm. And your relationship to the subject is interesting. You come from a Catholic background mm. yourself. How do you approach the study of religion in general, being a religious person? Yeah, I mean, well, I approach it two ways. I mean, you always have to think about when you're a religious study scholar, you know, trying to put yourself into it. So that's a really big thing. I, mean, I think for me that the biggest, the biggest thing that I operate with is that I want to respect people where they are in their faith. And so in other words, I'm not here to sort of tell you you're wrong. I'm not here to tell you that you should think differently. I'm here to try to understand why you do and what you do. I'm more interested in lived religion. I'm not interested in trying to change somebody or trying to win them over or anything like that. This is where I think my Catholicism helps me because I think if I maybe, if I came out of another tradition that was more proselytism based, I wouldn't be that. But then again, I also think that it wouldn't make me the scholar that I am if mm. I was that. So I think that's part of it is really important for me. I think that what helps me as a person of faith is probably going to sound something that's very contrary, but it very much is operational in the work that I do. I question everything. I don't just believe it just because you tell it to me or just because I read it or just because anything else. It's a, you know, the, the great thing about Catholicism, there's some things that are not great about it, but one thing is that you always have a conscience. You need to ask the questions. And if you can't ask the questions about your faith, if you can't ask questions about other people's faith, then what is the point? What is the point of doing the work? What is the point of trying to figure it out? And I also think that the last thing is that what, what I think and how I practice my faith is personal to me. So I don't try to put that on other people. I try not to make that be a big thing. There are lots of people who don't even know what I believe, and that's okay, because part of that is about me trying to be an inquisitive scholar and think about the things I do. I realize that that's not the way for everyone, but it is my way, and I think that that is what helps me do the work that I do. And I think that's important to emphasize that there are different perspectives and methods and, and ways that 
scholars of religion, religious studies scholars or historians approach their work. Some of them want to be more vocal about their yeah. faith. Some of them don't. And there actually is room in the academy for different styles mm -hmm. that way. Yeah, I mean, this is going to be a big battle in one of our um, groups in, in American Academy of Religion soon when we change over presidents, I think. That's it be happens every issue. time, doesn't it? Where yeah, people like, but I can think it, about this is going to happen next will? year. Yeah. Oh, the, yeah, it's going to happen. Is it typical thing of like two theological versus strict yes, religious studies? Yes, and this, yeah, and it's it's already causing some problems. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see how that, that falls out in the end. But I think that um, it's important that we try to, you know, think about how do we respect some other opinions? I mean, but in, in a place like Penn, I, I really cannot afford to sit in front of a classroom and talk about what I think every day when I have so many different kinds of students from atheists to, to Muslims, to Jews, to Sikhs, to, you know, I've got everybody. I've got Buddhists. I've got everyone. I've got people in my classes who, you know, I had one kid ask me a couple of years ago who was Chinese, who's Jesus? And I'm like, well, how do I approach this? Do I approach this from, let me tell you about our Savior, Jesus Christ? Yes, or exactly. do I say, this is historical Jesus? So, you know, yes. these are these questions yes. that they face you in the classroom that are very different. And you have to figure out how to how to talk about that. I mean, no, most people would go, are you joking? And I'm like, no, this is happening more and more. And people have to realize that a classroom, you know, even though we might teach about religion, there's lots of people who don't know a lot of things. And, you know, I need to be there for them, but I also need to be there for them in a way that they can learn and, and grow intellectually. The spiritual part, I believe, to the chaplain's office. When you wrote Women in the Church of God in Christ, before we go, I wanted to know if, if there was anything about the process of doing that book that changed you as a scholar or as a, just a person. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was broke. Uh, no, yeah. um, no let's put, let's put it like this. And I'm not... Um, now, I think what changed about me as a person was that and the process of writing a book is always hard. And what this was as a dissertation and what it was as a book was really is a lot different. Mm -hmm. It's profoundly different, actually. And um, it made me realize, A, I could, you know, I could write. And B, that writing is is really a lonely process. Mm -hmm. And you have to, no matter how much you do your research or how much you engage with people, if you don't know how to be alone, you can't hack it. And you just, you know, and some people can't, but I can't. And so this is something I really, you know, I've always known that about myself, but it really became very pronounced then. And so I think for me that the best thing about this was that I could go and engage all of these women and I could, you know, really have them be a part of my lives. And I hope that, you know, I gave them something when I met with them. But at the end of the day, I knew I had to pull back and go do this thing. Mm -hmm. I couldn't just be there. And sometimes, and I've, I've seen this happen before, people get so involved with who they're doing research on, they end up staying there and they don't get the work done. Yeah. It's, it's a really difficult balance, this idea that finding out how to be lonely, but mm -hmm. also taking advantage of being with other scholars and learning from other scholars, like it can't be done all alone, but there are parts of it that have to be done yeah. alone. And yeah, exactly. you kind of have to learn both of those things. Thea, this has been really fun. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. Yeah, you're welcome. That's Anthea Butler. She's graduate chair and associate professor of religious studies and Africana studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Butler's research and writing spans all sorts of topics, religion and politics, religion and gender, African-American religion, sexuality, media, pop culture and you might have heard or seen her on msnbc cnn she was even on fox news one time uh she's been in the new york times the washington post and today we talked about her book women in the church of god in christ making a sanctified world thanks thea thank you